Night Work, a Dave Brandstetter mystery, author Joseph Hansen, publisher Open Road Integrated Media, narrator Eric Aust. Chapter 12. It was a lazy ray, the warm tropical sort that now and then drifts up from Mexico. It fell all night on the shingles above the loft and made sleeping good. It was still coming down from ragged gray black clouds. When they went their separate ways, next morning Cecil took his van. Dave took the side-swiped car. Rain had leaked into it, probably because the rubber around the doors was rotten. The floor was puddled. Uh, the rubber of the wiper blades was also shot. He stopped at a filling station for new ones, then wheeled onto the first of three freeways that would take him out east of Pasadena to a plant called Techrite. That name and the names Kimsil and Agroplex on the new batch of waybills taken from Paul Meyer's closet drawer had interested Dave. Techrite occupied long buildings far off across the empty land backed by rain-shrouded mountains. The buildings were flat-roofed, windowless, featureless. A big white storage tanks loomed behind them to a security guard in a black rubber hat and poncho. Dave showed his license and explained his business. The guard made a phone call from inside his white stucco booth. Light flickered off his rain-slick poncho from a small black and white television set in the booth. He hung up the phone and came down out of the booth and leaned to the car window. An old hand pushed something shiny at Dave. A card enfolded in clear plastic printed with the name Techrite. Of the word visitor and some blank lines. Write your name on there, will you? The guard said. Truth is, I'm supposed to, but I can't hold a pen too good anymore. He appeared past retirement age. The raindrops on his drooping hound dog face looked like tears. When your name is on it, pin it to your jacket, and I'll open the gates and you can drive on in. Dave did as he was told. The guard continued to lean at the window, watching, but probably not seen. Dave pricked a finger, pushing the pin through his lapel. He sucked the finger. That do it. Fine, thanks. The guard stepped creakily up into the booth again and shut the door. The wide, high chain link gate swung open. Dave drove the ratty car through the end, headed it up a two-lane strip of blacktop that glistened in the rain. He passed parking lots filled with cars parked on the bias and neat, shiny rows. He drove on. A sign read, Executive Parking Lot. He slowed and almost swung in at the arrow, painted on the paving, then saw ahead, through the rain, another sign. Visitors. He left the battered Valiant there, among new Audis, Cutlasses, BMWs, and hurried head down toward double glass doors that glowed with light in the bleak, unbroken plain of the building front. He waited an hour for Lauren Shields in the reception room of offices marked public relations. He was not neglected. He was served tea from a Worcester pot and a Worcester cup and saucer. At a guess, English breakfast tea. There were English muffins. Uh, there was English marmalade. The young woman who served them on a Japanese lacquer tray was oriental herself. as She apologized smoothly and smilingly for Shields's tardiness at first. He was rarely late. It must be the rain. He had a long way to come, but as time dragged on, she became embarrassed. Little lines appeared between her beautiful brows. When she glanced up from the whispering electronic typewriter at her desk, saw Dave, saw the clock. Dave tried to make sense of a trade journal article on the molecular structure of a new breed of plastics. It gave her a smile. It's all right. I have no other appointments. I don't mind waiting. I can't think why he hasn't telephoned. In the end, a blonde, rosy-cheeked, chubby lad named Jotkum led him into an office that did not have a name on its door, and that was some little walk from Shields' door, which not only had Shields' name on it, but senior vice president as well. Jotkum probably wasn't even a junior vice president, but he was friendly and welcoming, for a while at least. At the word murder, his smile faded. He watched worriedly as Day brought out a rumpled cargo manifest from his jacket, unfolded it, held it out. Jochum read it, frowned. But this was weeks ago. He didn't have a way bill for what he was hauling that night. Did it come from here? Or could you check your files? Night of the ninth. Why? 
Jochum gave back the paper. Why tech right? It's some place to start. Uh, the records, Mr. Jochum. We've nothing to hide. Jochum touched an air combat. Shipping records for the ninth of this month. He tilted his head at Dave. But surely this man hauled all sorts of cargoes from all sorts of businesses. Not a lot that was dangerous, Dave said. Dangerous? Jochum's voice squeaked like a high school voice. What are you implying? We observe the strictest standards of safety in all our manufacturing processes. We have to. Most of our contracts come from the U.S. government. You have no idea the restrictions they impose. That suggests that some of the materials that go into TechRite products aren't exactly harmless. Jochum drew breath to answer, and the door opened. The young Oriental woman looked in. I'm sorry, Mr. Jochum, but files from around that time are missing. No one in shipping or order has them. Shall we keep looking? Jochum raised pale brows at Dave. Dave shook his head. Jochum said, That's all right, Francis. Forget it. Thank you. When the door closed behind her, Jochum said to Dave with a thin smile, The environmentalists really make very little sense. Why would TechRite or any of us manufacture products that would harm the very people who we want to serve and serve again? Think about that. There was the asbestos business, Dave said, and the coal mining business. Not to mention the lead business. But, okay, even if what you make is harmless, poisonous, pollutants, carcinogens come out of the manufacturing process, don't they? It's in the papers all the time. What does TechRite do with its toxic waste? Just a damn minute, Jochum's face was red. Are you holding Tech Right responsible for this trucker's death? And Dave looked blank. Why would you think that? Then I don't understand your line of questioning, Jochum said, and I don't like it. Let me explain, Dave said. He outlined the story of Paul Myers' lucrative, secretive late-night hauling operations. The beating of Paul Myers' wife, the early er, recruitment of Myers by Ossie Bishop. The curious circumstances of Ossie Bishop's death. I went down to Halkin to talk to his wife about it. She won't talk. She's frightened. But that I expected. What I didn't expect was that Ossie's truck was sold for cash. In a great hurry. Yes, Jochum asked wearily. To whom? To a woman known as the Duchess. Ever hear of her? Sounds like a cheap television show, Jochum said. Doesn't it? Unhappily, it's real. Why did she want that truck to disappear just when it was discovered that Paul Meyer's death was no accident? We farm out shipments to many independent truckers, Jochum said impatiently. We really have no control over their activities outside of their work for us. As for this missing truck, I can't help thinking the Duchess wanted it out of the way because it contained evidence that would link Myers' death to that of Ossie Bishop. And I wondered what sort of evidence that would be. The truck was empty, unlike Myers's, but law enforcement laboratories don't regard empty as the rest of us do. Uh, the Duchess must have been afraid traces of whatever Bishop was hauling at midnight in that truck were still there for electron microscopes to find. Are you suggesting that Tech right? Jochum began. I read a disturbing article last night, they said, in Scientific American. It describes the reactions of people who have handled toxic waste carelessly. A violent diarrhea, vomiting, coughing, lung congestion, paralysis of the diaphragm. The same symptoms Ossie Bishop showed before he died. I see. Jochum gave a short nod and stood up. Let me show you something. Can you spare me? He looked at his wristwatch. Half an hour? Forty-five minutes. He didn't wait for an answer. He opened a closet, took out a pale raincoat, a rumpled rain hat. I'm sure I can clear away all your doubts and dark suspicions. He smiled and opened his office door. Dave smiled back. Best offer I've had all day, he said, and followed Jochum out of the building. It was still raining in those fat, lazy drops, out of the sort of sky water colorist like best. Smudgy grays and whites beyond the hulking curves of the storage tanks. The mountains had already begun to show a tinge of green on their tawny summer hides. Dave walked beside Jochum into the executive parking lot, coming out of the lot, hurrying in a clear plastic raincoat that rustled. A tall man nearly collided with him, rain dripped from the brim of his rough Irish tweed hat. As he glared at Jochum, the tall man was Lauren Shields. 
This is Mr. Bramstetter, and Jochum told him. Dave wondered why the name seemed to startle Shields, or was he imagining things? Jochum said, He's an investigator for insurance companies. He's interested in our system of disposing of hazardous waste. I thought I'd just show him. Good idea. Shields gave a brisk executive nod, twitched a smile, and tugged the brim of his hat to Dave, and lopped off toward the bright doors of Techrite. And Dave got into Jochum's Cimarron. Uh, you're Mr. Shields. Looks like a man under a lot of strain. Lost his wife recently. Jochum drove down the long, wet tarmac strip to ward the gates. Very suddenly. It was a shock. She was young, beautiful. He worshipped her, built her a glorious new house, buried in April. Dead in September. Lauren hasn't collected himself. This place used to mean everything to him. Now, he doesn't even come in half the time. The kitchen help and rumpled food-stained white jackets and pants were eating when Dave stepped into Max Romano's through the back door. Steamy heat embraced him. The smells were overpowering of garlic, cheese, fish, onions, basil, oregano. Alex, the skinny head chef with caved-in, acne-scarred cheeks, looked up from his plate of Alfredo and gave Dave his graveyard smile. The other men in puffed white hats, fish soup, salad dessert chefs murmured welcomes. Dave pushed out a zinc-covered swing door into the quiet dining room. Max, short, fatter than ever, his few remaining curly locks combed glossily over his pet, was counting lunchtime checks by a tiny bright lamp. At the cash register, cocking an eyebrow at Dave, he turned back, a snowy cuff fastened by a big diamond stud to read his watch and shook his head in mock fatherly reproach. You're late again, he said. Keep everybody waiting. Dave laid a hand on his shoulder, then moved between white empty tables to the corner table, where Cecil sat. He gave him a kiss and sat down. I'm sorry. I was treated to a demonstration of how scrupulous Deckright is about dumping his toxic waste. He laughed, or what was meant to be that. A little green bottle stood beside Cecil's wine glass, Perrier water bubbled in the glass. You're not drinking. I didn't know how long you'd be, Cecil said. Didn't want for you to have to carry me out over your shoulder. He glanced through the sh shadows, looking for Max. But Max was already in the little bar. The restaurant was so quiet they could hear the clink of bottles, glasses, ice. They told them he was fixing their drinks. Cecil said, what was it instead? A farce. Dave told him the morning events. So we drove for 20 minutes to a place beyond, beyond, with high fences and warning signs, a square mile of carefully labeled barrels of dangerous chemicals. And guess what? A picket line. All these men, women, adolescents, little kids and jeans and parkas and slickers and stocking caps, carrying signs in the rain, a tech right, and the rest are poisoning the ground and water for miles around and dooming the people and their children for ages to come. Oh, wow. What did Josham say? He'd been lecturing me all the way how this was a government-approved dump. No danger of seepage, leakage, pollution. Techright and the others had gotten an order two years ago to clean it up and make it safe. It cost them millions. Oh, grief. Oh, sorrow. But now it was totally harmless. Max brought the drinks and set them down. Dave laughed again. And when Jotcham saw those pickets, he stopped the car so fast it stopped. Then he dented the rear bumper, turning around to get the hell out of there. Was television covering it? Men with cameras on their shoulders, pretty girls of both sexes with microphones. Another reason Jotcham stood not upon the order of his gulping. Dave grinned and picked up a chunky glass in which ice chilled Glenavit. Thank you, Max. What's left for lunch? No leftovers. Max wagged disapproving jowls. You tell me what you want, I fix with my own hands. And they told him, and he wandered away, a singing to himself. Dave drank. How'd you fare at Chemisil? And Agriplex? I interviewed two merchants of death. While you messed with one, Cecil pretended to preen. He drank, shrugged, made a wry face. Yes, that's what they mean by haste make waste. I didn't get anywhere. No one knew the Duchess. Dave lit a cigarette. 
Watching him wistfully, Cecil shook his head. They let me see the shipping records. Paul Myers didn't haul for them the night he died. Cecil reached for Dave's cigarette pack on the white cloth and drew his hand back empty. They used Aussie Bishop time to time, but when I raised the subject of toxic waste disposal, the interviews were over. I sure as hell didn't get an all-expenses-paid luxury vacation trip to the dump. Don't feel bad, Dave said. Maybe they haven't got a dump. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.